so finally, I'm uh, I'm Neil McLaughlin. Um, a lot of you, well, some of you may know me. Uh, I've been coming to EV to EVC for a few years now. Um, I'm a Citrix CTA. Um, it's my first year, and this year that I was awarded CTA, so quite proud of that. Um, I work as a Citrix and WVD architect for a company called New Signature in the UK. Um, quite new to that role. I've been doing it for around three months now. Um, so my main focus at the moment is mainly on Citrix Cloud and Windows Virtual Desktop, because um, you said you are a 100% cloud-first company, so um, we don't do any sort of on-prem at all. Um, so it's quite a shift in mindset for myself, um, so as I come from a sort of on-prem background. Um, so yeah, um, I've got a blog at virtualmac.co.uk. Uh, which I update now and again. Um, I also find me on Twitter at the WVD community, which we'll cover off in a minute. Um, so, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, this is not a presentation, um, who's best, all that kind of stuff. Um, each company's got their own specific reasons for choosing specific providers. Um, so, yeah, this is not bashing anyone. This is just a pure sort of look at the both the different stuff um, and what you can see. Um, let me put my webcam on for you. Yeah, make it a bit more personal for you. So this is my lockdown haircut. As you can see, it's uh, getting a bit scruffy. Um, so yeah, I'm just here to basically give you a high-level overview on WVD. Um, I'm just disclaiming as well, there are other options out there. So uh, this is just the stuff that I'm focusing on, the stuff that I know about. Uh, so do that. So yeah. Um, I run the WD community along with Stefan. Um, so we, we set the W community up about two months ago um, with a sort of aim of sharing knowledge around Windows Virtual Desktop because we noticed there's a lot of information out there, but there wasn't kind of a, a central place where you could go to sort of talk about WD. Um, so we've got a, a website um, which we mainly publish the weekly newsletter on every week that goes out every Sunday. Um, we've got a podcast which we released. Um, so we're trying to do that every other week. Um, so because obviously we've realised it takes up a lot of time. Um, so releasing new episodes every week. So at the moment we've had um, 331 downloads, which is quite good. Uh, I think we're on four episodes so far. And um, we've got a YouTube channel, um, which we publish the, the episodes onto. So um, the, the most popular, um, which I, I think about, is the Slack channel. So we've got a Slack channel, um, with the link's there. So if you want to talk about DVD or have any questions and stuff, feel free to jump in the Slack channel. We've got 265 people in there already, uh, which is quite impressive. So we've got people from Microsoft, like Tom Hicklin's in there quite a lot as well. So. Um, we've also got a request features thing in there as well. So if you want to provide feedback straight to the product teams, um, you can jump in there and uh, and can, Tom can feed that back on your behalf. Um, and we've also got a Twitter handle as well, so do we give community. So um, keep an eye on that. So we tweet, tweet stuff out now and again if there are any problems or any news updates, stuff like that. So it's 739 followers, um, which is not bad, just over two months. So. Um, I'm looking to to see that grow over the next few months as WVD hopefully gets more popular. Um, so yeah, just a big thanks to the community really. Um, I mean, these are not everyone, but just the people I've qu quickly think of this morning who sort of helped to contribute to this um, community thing for us. So Stefan, sort of the person who's been helping me out the most, um, we kind of run it together. Um, so we sort of liaise on stuff and check blog posts and do podcasts together and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I meant to put names of people under here, but I think I ran out of time. So um, yeah, I think you, you all probably know most of these people, so they are probably the most regular contributors to the community. So um, big thanks to them and the community wouldn't be what it was without all these people. So yeah, just a thank you. Um, so 2020. Is this the year of Windows Virtual Desktop? As you know, we always say, is this year of VDI? I think probably about five years ago or however long. Yeah, it's always been the year of VDI. Um, it seems to be the year, year of VDI every year. Um, so 2020, is it year of Windows Virtual Desktop? Well, we'll see. Um, so I've been around for a while. Um, so in over the years, I've seen quite a few technology trends. Um, 
And there's a few which sort of stick out in my head around what's going to make the most effect. Um, what I see um, sort of has a big effect on how we use and deploy technology. Um, so I remember back in 2005, I used to work for uh, Department of Working Pensions in the UK, which is a big government agency. And um, so I, I was part of their test environment. So we basically used to build um, test environments for them and get them to test all the applications and stuff like that. So, um, and we had like literally a whole data center just for the test environment. And it was full of like bull servers, if anyone remembers those, um, sort of big sort of 10U servers with rack, lots of racks and racks and racks and storage and stuff. So, and then um, obviously this was the very early days of virtualization. So you had VMware ESX 1.5 and stuff. So um, we used to use Virtual PC 2005 to, to run their test environment uh, for basic testing. Um, so we used to have a, I think it's 500 gig external USB drive, um, which used the HCD spinning disks. And um, yeah, we just used deployed virtual PC. Um, and that for me was like, mm, hang on, I can literally take a whole row of racks and deploy it into running on a couple of desktop PCs with a load of RAM in them. So that kind of opened my eyes up to virtualization. And then I decided, okay, I really want to focus on that as my career. Um, and then in 2010, um, I used to, went to work for another government agency um, and they were using Ardense, if anyone remembers that. So that is what became Citrix PVS. Um, so we'll be using that to build um, and deploy a Citrix presentation server 4.5 estate. And that was running on Ardense. Um, and again, I was like, mm, okay, I can take a image and I can deploy it to as many servers as I want to, um, literally within minutes. And that server is going to beat up every day with a clean image. And it worked an absolute dream. And this was back in 20, 2010. Um, really, if you look at PVS now, it hasn't really changed that much. So it's still a great, great product. Um, my favorite service products ever, to be honest. Uh, just the, the way it works and how quick it is to deploy and clean boot every time, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in 2015, um, I entered the, the world of banking. So I, I spent a few years working for a lot of different financial industries. So um, I basically did a lot of um, Hyper-V um, in large data centers, obviously financial environments, have, have you regulated, complicated networks, SAM storage, Hyper-V 2008 and Windows XP and Windows 7 and all that stuff. And I did that for five years. Um, and then, um, Last year, I just, well, end of last year, I decided, right, okay, and um, this cloud technology stuff looks quite interesting. So I started to look into that. Um, and then so this year, I started to look, started to work for a, a company where I could actually start deploying that every day. Um, and that's, well, I sort of got introduced to WD end of last year. Um, and that's what I decided I wanted to focus on because I saw how good this could be. Um, so yeah, that's why I decided to get a job as a, a WVD architect. Um, so I feel the same way as I felt about the technology about WVD and the fact that you can deploy stuff so quickly at scale um, and at not much cost, as we'll, as we'll soon find out. Um, I think it's, uh, it's going to be a game changer um, for sure. So. Uh, does anyone remember this? So this is a, a video that I remember seeing um, a few years ago. Um, and this is basically what our dents used to be, which became PVS. And it's a fact that you can basically just deploy um, a room full of desktops and, and then basically just a stream an image onto them um, and then deploy all those at the same time. So effectively, what we are doing in today's world is on-prem uh, back then is what we can basically do now in Azure. We can take an image, we can deploy it to a load of desktops, spin up those desktops and just off they go. So yeah, just thought I'd show that for a little bit of a nostalgic state. I'm sure there's a few people in the uh, in the audience who, uh, who remember that product well. Um, so go back on. why does? Um, when I first got introduced to Daz, I was kind of like, why, why would you want to do that? Um, we spent so much time affecting sort of Citrix and VMware on-prem to have these sort of millisecond latency in our 
on site data centers and get it, the stop 10 second logons for users and having a truly optimal experience. And now we want to go and put a load of desktops in the data center halfway across the world. Why would you want to do that was my first thought, because that's just going to be stupid. Um, but now that I've kind of seen the benefits of it, I kind of see why, um, why it's a good, not option for everyone, um, but it has its certain use case scenarios. So we can scale desktops quickly. So if you turn around to me, um, I say, I want to build up 10,000 desktops on a Friday evening, no problem. I'll have them ready for you on Monday. Um, I was chatting to uh, Tom Hickling on our, our podcast and he was telling me um, a customer came to them on Friday and they wanted um, all their users um, to be up and working um, remotely on the Monday. So they migrated, well, they built and migrated 6,000 users over the weekend, ready to log on on Monday. So that's the kind of power that we can do now. So if you're working in a, a sort of truly on-prem environment, um, maybe a bit difficult to do that. You could do it, um, but it would be a bit tricky with networks and stuff like that. So um, you've got no upfront capex. Uh, obviously, you've got cost savings. So I've worked in projects in the past where we've had to spend five million quid on kit. Uh, we've had to get that inside the data center. We've had to configure it all. It's taken months to get the network fiber rules in place and blah, 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 blah. blah. I can do that now. It's a push of a button. So um, we can spec our workloads exactly how we want them. So we can have AMD GPUs. We can have NVIDIA GPUs. We can spec how much RAM, how much IOPS, the type of processors, blah, 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 you name it. Whatever config you want, we can give that to you um, without having to spec up physical servers stuff and wait for them to be installed and racked and stacked and all that stuff. Um, and then we need to focus on your service without having to worry about the stuff. So Microsoft take care of that all for you. Um, so yeah, and obviously um, another biggie for me is we can now place your workloads close to your users. So um, if you've got a load of users in offshore, work in India, um, connecting back to your UK data center, uh, may not be great, especially if you companies are still old school and still have old MPLS networks and stuff like that with like one meg lease lines and stuff. Um, I can now deploy a load of VMs to Azure in India um, and have like a sub 30 milliseconds latency to my users. Um, nice, better experience. Um, so we are seeing a shift in the market. So um, this is just a, Something that I picked up yesterday from the, the VDL like Pro survey, so um, which I found quite spectacular. It's thirty-seven percent respondents are now deploying a will look at deploying a DAS solution. Um, so that's a lot of people. Um, Nineteen percent have had the solution in one year or less, um, and fourteen percent hope to will have it in, in place for two years. So quite a shift from last year, not a massive increase, but um, certainly a shift um, which will hopefully continue to go up um, as the use cases for it get more and more. Um, I think we're still not quite ready yet to have 100% DAS, um, but the, the use cases will continue to increase. Um, so another quite interesting information from uh, from yesterday's um, report which was released. Um, so what's today's biggest challenges? Um, in your on-prem environments, migration to the cloud was the top one. Um, why you're using, um, when, why you're using interesting DAS and cloud first strategy, which a lot of companies are deploying, obviously, because it's uh, part of their sort of company strategy. Um, what are the biggest challenges in using public cloud cost? Um, I have a varying opinion on this, and um, yes, it's, can be expensive, but look at what you're getting. Um, if you think about compared to an on-prem environment, um, you can't really think of it for like for like, because when you think about your on-prem environment, you've got the cost of running your data center, you've got the cost of power, electricity, maintenance, managing those images, all those other costs behind it, which people kind of forget about. Um, if you're deploying 5,000 desktops, you've got the cost of floor walkers putting those desktops onto it, the user training, which you have to go to the desk for because it's a physical device, all that stuff, people tend to forget about that. And um, so always think about that when you think about deploying a solution. Um, I know of the respondents, 26% of them said they were using um, WVD, um, which is quite good. So that's obviously quite a, quite a lot of people. Um, so coronavirus hit, um, obviously, 
that has a big effect on how our home working is going to continue. Um, so I think we saw from yesterday's slide, I saw one which basically said that I think 85% of people will look at it continuing to work from home. Um, now that they've seen how good it is, um, which is quite spectacular. I mean, my my previous role, I left because they wouldn't let me work from home. I was having to commute 500 miles a week there and from back. I spent 10 hours a week in the car um, and they wouldn't let me work from home. Um, a month after that coronavirus hit, and guess what? The whole company now works from home and a lot of them won't be going back. So it's that shift in mindset, which is sort of, going to see us accelerate this kind of technology more. I think we've heard lots of scenarios where people have said, oh, we've done basically three years worth of development in a couple of months because your hand's been forced. Basically, you, you've been thinking about doing this stuff for a while. Now you've had to do it. You've had no option. So there are no financial reviews and stuff. It's kind of, we need a solution. We're losing money. Get something out there. Um, and I think that's why WVD has become so popular so quickly um, because it's so quick and easy to deploy um so yeah i mean this is new world versus old world basically um i think we we're all going to see this way of working for, for a long time to come yet so and for me it's a positive thing um i've been doing this stuff for years i've, I've seen the power of, of sort of working from home and having a, a virtualization solution that enables that as well um so Another big thing for me is there's, there's no subscription costs. So um, you've got no commitment buying. If you want to try out for one user, you can do. If you want to try out for 100 users, you can do. If you don't like it, fine. Um, you don't have any talk on blocking and stuff like that. So the only thing you do need is um, a Microsoft 365 license, which most people have got these days, right? Um, so yeah, a lot of companies to speak to are quite shocked when they find out they can actually use this technology for free. It's not going to cost them anything extra. Um, so yeah, as long as you've got e fee license, you're good to go with WVD. Um, so that's a that's a, a conversation we have a lot with customers, um, and it's the reason another reason why the, the uptake's been so high. And um, again, the the architecture is very simple. So the, the customer manages the the clients. So again, you HTML5 clients, Android, iOS, Windows. They're all they're all supported um the stuff which microsoft looks after so they've got the web access diagnostics all the stuff which sits in the azure platform um then obviously we've got our customer managed stuff so we've got our azure ad which you need it's one of the requirements so most people again have azure ad now um if they're especially if they're office 365 user and sinking back to their sort of physical domain controllers which is what we see more often or they deploy a virtual machine and Azure and promote that to the main controller and use that to connect back to your to your kitchen's web. So um, yeah, this is the basic architecture and certainly one um, that we see deployed often. So if we want to deploy a VM, it's really quick to do so. This is just a, an example of just the stuff that you need to provide. So you just need a subscription. Um, you need a, a resource group setting up in Azure, which you can do. If you don't have one, you can set that up while you're doing it. Um, host pools, um, which contains all your servers, your location. So it's in multiple regions now. Um, I think the, the big goal is for Microsoft to have WVD in every single region. Um, that would be nice. Um, I think with the sort of track and it's been taken, they might become a reality. Reality, sorry. Um, I'm sure it will do. I hope it does because um, it'll make it an even better solution. Um, host pool type, so we can have personal type, personal VMs, and a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, we can have shared VMs, which can have multiple users logging onto. So that's the, the Windows 10 um, multi-user edition, um, which is obviously only um, as you can only get in Azure. Um, so yeah, mentioned resource groups, um, locations. We can have virtual machine sizes as you want them. So you can go as big or you can go small as you want. Um, depends on your use case, which we'll cover off shortly. And as you mentioned, you've got your Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session. Um, you can deploy images from a VHD file, you can deploy images from a gallery. Um, so I'm not sure if you would use the shared image gallery. So um, in Azure, a shared image gallery enables you to deploy images globally. So you can have a, a shared image gallery per region or however, however you want it. So 
it's a it's a good way of managing your images so you can do version control in there and stuff as well um we can create our own virtual network so we can plug into our existing vnets in azure or we can create dedicated vnets in azure you could put fiber rules in place you can control your traffic exactly how you want to um you can sit behind the you don't have to have a public ip um so your vms that you can deploy um will be accessible by the front end but um you have to go through the the wd broker um to connect to them so they're not not internet facing as per se um so yeah um so this is a quick thing i mean one thing which i mentioned before one thing that i've always been impressed about was sort of citrix mcs pvs for example is how quickly we can get things up and running the same accounts with wd so um this is something which uh, marcel Miura um put out so he managed to create um 1200 session hosts um in just under 90 minutes which is quite impressive and um, so you think about it if you're fitting 10 users onto that that's potentially 12,000 users so um straight out of the box you can deploy a 12,000 user deployment in under 90 minutes which is just to me it blows my mind still to this day um so this is where we are this is where we are with technology right now um and it's a it's a very very usable solution i've done a few um a few of these and yeah this uh the customers that i've deployed to absolutely love it they love the how quickly it's deployed they love the speed um so i'd suggest give it a try if you can um so yeah so it's still young i mean it's been I think less than 12 months old um it's been a lot of updates to it and um, they still are the 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 pace of change is quite spectacular um it seems like every every week or every other week there's a major release or something going on and um, if you check out our wd community site and just look at the blogs and just read what's been released it, it's quite insane so um we just had the spring update so we've got arm service so now it's fully integrated into the azure resource monitor azure resource resource manager um we can now publish the ad groups we've got our back roles where we can do it straight from the portal um we can scale out easily so i mentioned that before i can deploy 100 hosts from the GUI quite easily um we've got wd monitoring plugging straight into log analytics so you can build your own power bi dashboards or however you want to do so you can monitor the cpu and um, stuff so um we've got metadata storage location so if you financial industry you can now select different regions within the us at the moment but it's coming to the rest of the regions so that's not quite there yet but it will be fully coming um we've got a full new set of powershell powershell support uh, modules um so that so the the wed used to have its own little powershell module it's now plugged into the native azure powershell stuff so um that's good um of course we just had teams wvd optimization um which is very 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 impressive if you've not tried it uh, me and stefan tried it the day it's released literally and we were both blown away um how good it was um that basically offloads all the resources onto your local host so it, it saves all the network and bandwidth connections going through your wvd desktop so it offloads all the cpu the gpu the audio the video so yeah i'd highly recommend you do that especially if you're looking to use wvd in a team's environment um we've got msa msax app attached coming um that's going to be a biggie as well um that'll be interesting to see how quickly that's adopted um you used to have to apply for it as part of windows inside the preview but now it's available straight out of windows um 204 so you can go check that out uh, right now if you want to use it um it's in public preview so there's nothing stopping you using it in a production environment if you're happy to take the risk uh, but i don't really see many people doing that because it's still maturing quite a lot and msa access technologies is still quite young as well um so stuff's coming um so i just mentioned we've got the teams which is released um scale session host using azure automation so that's coming in q4 apparently so we're gonna have full automation based on user metrics so that's uh, virtually every single customer i speak to and um, they ask for that so that's going to give us the ability to scale up and scale down on user metrics so 
Um, there are third party solutions out there at the moment which do that for you. Um, but hopefully that's going to go into the port, go straight into the product. Uh, so key, key four, so have a look at that. Um, and we've also got different latency improvements. So um, you can connect to your different regions now. So at the moment, everything gets broken through the US. Um, so they're coming um, in Q3 as well. So that's the roadmap page, which keep an eye on like constantly pages. So um, client connection options. So client connection options straight out of the box, pretty much same as Citrix, I'd say. Um, if you just want to do straight connections without any fancy configurations. So um, obviously Windows, Web, Android, Mac OS client. So obviously the Citrix workspace can do more. Um, it's more configurable, but the 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 RDP, the Windows virtual desktop client is a bit more simpler. Um, but does its job. It enables you to connect to your applications and your and your desktops quite simply. Um, think like connection options. So um, as we know, Citrix has been around for a while. Which every client, think client out there supports Citrix. Um, with WD being quite young, there's not as much support. So, um, but Agile's leading the way on that one. So, if you look at their their devices, you can um, they support it natively. So, Tenzig as well, they support it natively, and you can also use Windows 10 IoT devices as well, and just install WD Cloud on there as well if you want to. Um, if you think that supports that, so, and the client gets updated around every two weeks at the moment with improvements. So, um, again, it's constantly improving and getting better. Um, profile management, so Citrix, um, most Citrix deployments you see um, used to be um, Citrix UPM. Um, these days it's FS Logix um, that I see most out in the wild. Um, the same with WVD, FS Logix used to go to one. Um, obviously, you can still use local profiles on Windows if you want to. Don't know why you want to do that, but uh, but yeah, I think from both both of them, FS Logix is the new sort of uh, profile management king. Obviously, there are third party vendors out there. Um, so OS deployment. So this is where I'm starting to see a big change and a shift. Um, so Citrix, obviously, most people either use Citrix MTS or they use PBS. Um, WVD. What I see is either people use, so Azure Image Builder is quite a new technology um, that's still in public preview that enables you to build um, images by scripts. So you can plug in, um, so it's built on the Packer platform. So you can totally script your desktops um, end to end if you want to, including all your application installations and stuff like that. Um, you can use ARM templates to build your desktops. Um, you can just do it out of the GUI if you're not comfortable in doing the above. We can use Terraforms. Um, I guess you could use the same for that Citrix as well if you wanted to. I think there's another um, another presentation today someone's doing on that. Um, we can use DevBot pipelines to, to build our desktops and manage our desktops. We can use Packer. Um, so to me, because WVD plugs so nicely into the, into the Azure ecosystem, essentially what we're starting to see is we saw infrastructure as a code where you can build out your whole infrastructure um using code i think we're heading very fast towards building your desktops as code so i can deploy my desktops i can install the applications i can manage the updates i can distribute image galleries i can assign to users all using code so if you think about that for example as a default pipeline um i was speaking uh, stefan um he was telling me he had one customer totally hands off. Every month they had a DevOps pipeline job, which ran past the VMs, built the VMs, distributed the VMs, user got an email, test it, test it okay, click, click, continue, work through that DevOps pipeline, and everything's okay, it just automatically deploys the desktops to the users without anyone having to do anything. So that's the, the kind of power um, that I see happening in the future. Day-to-day -day management, so I think at the moment, it's still finding its feet. Um, so obviously, pre-spring, we had everything was managed by PowerShell. Um, Citrix definitely wins a day on this one. Um, so you've got Citrix Studio and Director, all very sort of good products to use, make it very easy. People from the help desk and administrators to manage systems, deploy desktops, or monitor systems. Um, WVD is getting better. Um, we can still do a lot of PowerShell management. Um, we can do 
using the Spring Update, you can do a lot of things through the Azure portal, as in Rebeat Desktop, see who's connected. Um, another good one is WVD Admin, um, written by Marcel Miura. Um, that gives you a lot of features. You, again, you can deploy desktops, you can see who's connected, send messages to users, log users off, all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you need good management as well, you've got Nerdio. So Nerdio is a paid product um, and you get a nice dashboards and a bit finer, fine grain user control that you would normally get with Citrix. Um, that's just a link to WVD admin. Um, if you're using WVD in any way, shape or form, I highly, highly recommend um, you do that. I use it in all my deployments because um, it's uh, so, so easy to use. Um, that's just a, a screenshot, so that's what you see. So it looks a bit basic, but it's actually very, very powerful. Um, so yeah, thanks to Marcel Muro for that. Um, so Nerdio, so that's just a few features you can do with Nerdio. Um, so you can, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much long on that, but yeah, you can look at the link and have a look at that. If you're, if you're serious about using WD and you've got the budget, take a look at it. Um, Sapago, so they do quite a lot of stuff for um, WVD, so they've got an Azure Monitor WVD, um, which plugs into the analytics stuff, which enables you to build nice dashboards, CPU utilization, trend storage. Um, VDAS start for WVD, which is quite a nice little tool, which enables the users to start up desktops themselves. So that can be quite a nice cost saving exercise for you. Um, Sapago Auto Scale. So that gives you auto scanning features. So again, another cost saving exercise and, and WD admin as well, which we've just covered. Um, so yeah, Azure regions, which you mentioned earlier, um, VM type, so you can deploy both VM types from Azure. So you've got A series, B series, D series, S series, NV series, which are the GPU ones. Um, so they're, they're quite good. If you want GPU stuff, I'll quickly run through these because um, I did this like quite a lot long long time ago, so it's probably a bit out of date, but um yeah, I mean you can average from a average around the desktops I deploy, you're average around hundred pounds a month, um, which is not too bad. So obviously we have to pay for compute and storage costs, but um it's not as expensive as you think it would be. Um so with GPU, so the GPUs are changing. There are a new new set of uh I think it's NV series GPUs with A and um, GPUs, which are a lot more cost cost effective. Um, but that's a, another topic. So I think Thomas Poppergaard did a quite good blog post on that. So um, if you're in, a bit interested a bit more, um, have a look at his post. So um, I did this slide before the Teams um, W optimization. So if you're not ready for the WD Teams optimization yet, um, if you're using a GPU, it's recommended for Teams. So um, this is a, a blog post from NVIDIA and they sort of show the effect of using Teams on a, on a GM, VM without a GPU. So as you can see, pretty much kills the, the CPU. I've seen this, so I've seen it myself. Um, so the users that I deploy to say, oh yeah, but Teams works. I say, yeah, it works, but it's actually killing your, your desktop. So um, obviously using the new um, optimization takes all those problems away. So that's the, the optimization stuff, as you can see. Um, what I've got is the WVD resource. So we can see teams using 1% CPU and 400 megabyte of memory. So this is a call that I was doing myself and Stefan. So the teams was actually offloading onto my local host device. Uh, and that was using 38% CPU using four, four megabytes a second of memory of bandwidth. Um, so yeah, it's very, very impressive and it works very well. So I highly suggest you take a look at that if you're, if you're deploying um, WVD. Um, and that's based on the WebRTC protocol. Um, as mentioned, just everything's offloaded to your local device. Um, so it's basically peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so the, it doesn't go through your WD desktop. So the experience is good. Storage. Um, so I recommend if you're deploying desktops to allocate an extra data disk um, and install your apps onto that. So you get better IOPS for that. So they're the different disks you can deploy um, to get different throughputs. Obviously, with Azure, the, the bigger the disk is, the more IOPS you get. Um, so make sure you get your IOPS requirement correct. Um, this is an example of an issue which I hit upon when I was doing a proof of concept for a customer. They are quite intensive um, customers, so they actually hit the, the limitation on their 
IOPS, so a, a VM with a default driver 127 gig will only give you 500 IOPS, so, um, and they had quite intensive applications, so be careful of that if you're deploying, um, but keep an eye on your IOPS uh, and deploy extra data disk or a bigger OS disk if you need the extra bump in there. Um, ignore the maximum recommendations, um, always do your own testing, um, always do a POC, enable the analytics, analyze the data. Um, so example, um, I use the D4S version three and we only managed to get five users on there. Uh, I think the Microsoft Talons would get 12 users on there, but this customer had quite a few intensive applications. Obviously disable the search service and run search with optimizer as you would do, that's what I use, it does the job. Um, and slow your applications onto a data disk for better performance. Um, auto scanning coming. Um, application, so you can still publish apps, same as you did with Citrix, um, using the remote app. So not as many options as Citrix, but if you just want the basics, it works. Um, so applications is the most important thing normally. Um, obviously, we've discussed before, we've got MSRX Appetite, which is coming. And um, so that's basically container-based applications using the, the inbuilt, pretty much the same redirection that we use for the profile management. So that's going to be big when it goes fully. Um, that, as I mentioned before, that came in the, the May 2020 update. Um, so which leads me on to the general overall question, Citrix or WD? Well, it depends. If you've got a something which needs the extra capabilities with Citrix brings, use Citrix. It costs more, but you get more. Um, it's catching up slowly. I mean, I've took this slide off a, a company called Citrix Solutions that I found, and, and that gives you basically the nice features that you get with Citrix. So obviously you get all the MCS, advanced monitoring, auto scale, Teams. Now you've probably noticed all those things that I mentioned weren't available in WD not long ago, but they are now. So it's slowly catching up and the, the features are getting closer and closer. Citrix will always have its use case. Um, I'm sh pretty sure of that. In a large enterprise environment where you need the additional flexibility configuration, there'll always be a need for Citrix. If you just want the basics, use WD. If you just want to connect to a basic application, it's, it's, it does the job. Um, so they just say, for example, just Citrix Cloud features, which released over the past few years. So as you see, most of them, just showing the grand LIT and the extra features what you get with Citrix, you get to control, physical load balancing, also scale, MCS with Google Cloud, for example, those extra stuff which you want. Um, this is how I like to think about it. So Citrix, expensive, but you get the features with it, it does the job uh, that you need it to, and you need those enterprise class features. If you just want the basic features to get you from A to B, and you don't need all those features which Citrix brings to you, WVD is a very, very nice option indeed. Um, so, so easy to use, no subscription costs, no buy-in, yeah. Um, so yeah, it depends. You've got a large environment which you need to use features for, use Citrix, very simple environment. You want a couple hundred or maybe thousand users, WVD, if it fits the job for you. I mean, ask yourself, most Citrix deployments you see, how many of the features are you actually using that you need? Probably not many. Just cut to your desktop, launch a few apps, done. Um, but so you can fix up both. So why not have a cheaper WD solution for your, for your contract staff, for example, and have Citrix for users that need those extra features. Um, WD ecosystem. So this is a slide from Marius um, Sambi, um, which you can see you've got a lot of third party plugins which you can use. So um, you got applications for Liquid, Liquidware, Sapago, all those stuff could plug in to make the solution a bit better. Obviously, you pay for them, but if you if you want those kind of features, um, they're there. So, your Vana solution, your desktop supports the issue of code, no patching, just rebuild every month. Um, your profile sits on FS Logics, your apps are MS up attached, happy desktops, happy users. Um, get your VM sizing right. Um, if you go too small, the users will notice. But so, um, the good thing with WD is you can change size quite quickly. Um, so don't be scared of choosing too small and then slowly ramping up. Um, decisions to make, scale up or scale out. Um, dedicated VMs can be very expensive, so use shared VMs if you can. Um, reverse, reserved desktops are only cheaper if you only go over a certain amount of hours per month, so work out your costings. Um, 
Otherwise, sometimes pay as you go desktops can be cheaper than reserved desktops. Um, so get that right. Um, power management, so that's going to come with the auto scaling. No one size fits all. Keep VMs closer. Think about the apps um, and build your redundancy in architecture um, just as you would do to physical infrastructure. So just because it's an Azure, that means we're redundant, we're at the box. So um, be careful with that one. So most people just deploy um, and forget about all that stuff. Um, just some tips. Um, there's a limitation on the core subscription. Um, make sure you get your scaling right. So obviously, FS logics. If you run out um, space, that will break all your users. So make sure you get that right. Um, Multi cloud. Um, obviously, that's a bit difficult with WD because you're pretty much using Azure. But as I said, you can use different solutions for different people. Don't have to use WD for all people, uh, and you just use it for one which fits most. So. Couple of links in there for community people. Obviously, my website, um, Christian Brinkoff, obviously has a lot of different information on um, WD. So check out his site for a lot of uh, step by step guides. And um, WD Logics, Patrick Collar, he does some great stuff. Uh, Marcel Muras, obviously, Baz, Dean, Ryan. So they all, all produce great blogs and stuff like that. So, and yeah, I think I'm a bit over my time, but I've quite a lot of slides to cancel. So if you've got any questions or anything, Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter afterwards or anything like that. So, yeah, thank you. Did there see the way I stop that? All right, I see. <clears throat> thank you for the great session. Well, you should be okay. able to see that as well. Are you uh, sure we extra licensing to use FS Logic with Citrix? Um, so for use FS Logic, I still think you need the E free licensing, I believe. All right, great, we have that. All right. <clears throat> Uh, if you have if you have any slides that you skipped or missed, you can you can still have some time because the room number one, uh, sorry, the room number two is still in the session. So we kind of will try to align it a little bit. All right, okay. Um, if you want to, I can quickly go over. Um, so just in case I actually. Oh, sorry. There's uh, there's another question. Yep. Uh, Sorry, there's there's a statement from Jim which says you don't need E3 RDS call or Win10 VDA will do. So he's basically saying ah. the enterprise agreement is not necessary. RDS calls or Windows 10 VDAs will do. All right, another okay. question: With Citrix, you always need an RDS license, which includes FS Logics, right? Well, not always. Yes. You need only in case you use the uh, Xenap. You. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure to be honest with you. Um, so, I mean, if you've got spare time, I can quickly show you. So, this is my little test environment I have in Azure. Um, but I have like a domain controller, which I've got, and then this is a just a, a WVD desktop, which I have. Um, so, as you can see, this is just a normal a normal VM. Um, I'm just using a Windows 10 Enterprise version virtual desktop, so just the standards. D2AS. So let me see if I've got my desktop still running in the background, which I let me just uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is the, the client. So in here you can do stuff. So you've got like about um then yeah, you can select um different settings. So from here I can use my configure my display settings. Um and then if we connect to desktop, see if I can show you. Yeah, so this is my test user. How long have we got left, Alex? Um, I don't know, 10 minutes. All right, okay. If you so really this is... to show something, not that they'll push you to show something and then the demo doesn't work or something? No, no, don't worry, demo will work. Um, yeah, so um, this is a, a WVD desktop um, that I'm using. So I just connected to that by the client. 
Um, as you can see, performance is quite quite happy. So, um, so this is just a standard image gallery that I've got. So you can you can use your custom images if you want to. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I wanted to, I could just pick the VM and then play out. So this is a standard um, version with obviously you've got your your office tools in there and stuff as well. So um, you can connect back to your on-prem environment as well if you want to with that as well. Um, so from the portal, um, let me, so this in the new spring portal, um, you've got straight in the thing here. So you can go to Windows Virtual Desktop in here. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the control plane. Um, so from here, we can do different stuff. So we've got our users control plane. Um, so we can search for users. We've got our workspaces. Um, that have, so I just set up a, a single test one. Um, so we can look at sort of activities. Um, we can do access control. So role assignments, our back roles. So you can assign help desk users and stuff like that if you want to. Um, you can deploy remote apps from here as well. So, so if you go to the host pools, um, so let's have a look at that. So I've got two types of pools. I've got a pool post, a pool host pool and a personal host pool. So I believe the one which I'm, so I've got an app pool, uh, which is for publishing applications. Um, so I've just done the, the usual notepad, uh, which everyone uses. What I was going to do, which I didn't get time to, I was going to try and package up, um, MSX app attach app using um, Citrix Zentals. Um, and I was going to connect back to a, a Zen server, especially for Alex, but I didn't get time. Um, but obviously, got that, that VM isn't up and running at the moment. Um, so, yeah, we've got the sorry, Dave, you can see sessions in there. Sorry, go on, Alex. No, okay. I'm saying it did not work. <laughs> Yeah, so that was the plan, but I say I didn't get time. So we can see in here, so got my active session from the desktop that I'm that I'm connected to. Um go here, the other dirt. So I can I can log users off, can put stuff into drain mode, which will stop users connecting from their desktop. So I mean the the good thing is, so say for example, my boss came to me on a Tuesday and says, Neil, we've got two hundred users starting um on Monday. I'd be like we need to set up the desktop for them. So we can go, right, okay, no problem. So we can literally just go into the host, the small, we can create a new registration key. And so registration key is kind of security token, um, which you need to produce add host to the pool. So I can just go into here and I can go add, see, so you get that. So let's create a registration key, uh, bah, bah, bah. So let's create one. So generate a new key. So I'm going to configure it for today. And I'm going to configure it for 11. 11 oh, nope. It's a bit iffy about the. Uh, 11. Six. So that sets the expiry token. So set that. Okay, so it's created that for me. Come on, and that should pop up there. Uh, no, okay. This session just up. No, okay. Uh, host pools, do -do -do, spring host pool. Okay, so session hosts. This is why you don't do live demos. Tracy key. Tracy key. Space date if it's if let's do it as the okay. There you go. That's what's supposed to happen. Copy that. Okay. So then we can go back to our session host. Also close that. We can go to add. So from here, I can select my subscription. 
my resource group. I host Paul. So these are all pre-selected default for you. Um, so from what you had in previously. Uh, so I can go to virtual machines. Um, I can have my virtual machine location, which I'm going to select for UK South. Yeah, so these are all the regions that you can connect to. So I'm going to go UK South. Now, this is a great thing. All I can do here, if I were to select 5,000 in there, or 500, sorry, there you go, maximum 500. I could do that. And literally, um, all I have to do, I'm not going to do it because obviously I'll go bankrupt. Um, but it's uh, so virtual network, so you can select your VNet, so you can firewall off your VNets if you need to, connect back to your on prem environment, for example. KP, set up your network security groups as you want to, so you can lock them down or keep them open or however you want to do, and um, specify your domain. So you put your domain in there that you want to join. Um, and then you OU, you, um, your domain join account, click next, next, create, and that's it. Um, and then what will happen, it'll go off and it'll just deploy those VMs for you. Um, and if you set the users as part of the, as an AD group, um, those users will automatically get access to that pool as well for you. So, yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed my session. Um, and if you get any questions, feel free to um, speak to me on Twitter. We'll head over to the WD community website and uh, just have a look.